Hello. Uh, so could you please introduce yourself and let us know where, uh, where we are and what we're doing today? My name is Nick Corker. I'm co-founder, CEO and CTO of First Light Fusion. And we're in Oxford at our headquarters. What got you interested in science even at first? What got me interested in science? Well, I was always interested in science. Um, I was always interested in, in technology. Um, but um, so my first degree was, was mechanical engineering. And um, I suppose at school I, I, I loved physics and I, and I liked you know, hard problems. But um, uh, I wanted to work on something or work on or I spend my life on things which actually have impact and application in the real world. So I chose to do um, engineering. And when do you think you first heard the term fusion? Well, I heard about fusion power at, at school. Um, but um, it wasn't that I set out on a mission to work on, uh, work on fusion. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I liked physics, studied engineering. Um, it wasn't until I started my PhD that I started working on fusion. And even that, it wasn't uh, you know, that I um, set out to, to work on fusion. Um, I was doing my um, master's project with uh, my supervisor and co-founder of First Light Fusion, um, Janis Ventikos. Um, and he said, hey, Nick, I've got a, I've got a PhD project. I'm wondering if you're interested in it. And I said no, <laughs> um, because uh, I was in a long distance relationship and I was sick of that. So uh, I decided to go and you know, move away um, and uh, I wasn't going to do the PhD. And I realized that I said no without actually asking him what the project was. And so I thought I probably should go back and ask him what the project was. Just to check, just, just to make sure. Just to make sure, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and he told me all, all about this, this, um, this thing, which was a novel idea for fusion. And um, it was actually the fact that it was a novel idea, much more than the fact that it was fusion, which really, initially, got me into it. But then when I kind of considered whether to take the PhD, um, I thought, you know what, a chance to work on something so meaningful as fusion doesn't come on very often. I should take it. And then there was no looking back, I guess, once you picked fusion. Uh, has it gone quickly now till today? How, uh, long, how long ago was that? So that was, that was in 2008. Um, and we started First Light Fusion in 2011. And I finished my PhD in 2012. And then I've been with First Light uh, ever since. Um, has it gone quickly? Are you, are you um, glad you went back and checked then? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we've, we've, it's uh, being an entrepreneur. Um, uh, you spend all your time looking forwards and very little time looking backwards. So um, the 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 it's more the the feeling of being at first light is more a uh, sense of you know onrushing progress. Um, and whenever we do pause and look back, um, I well I think it's pretty amazing what we've, what we've achieved. Transitioning from you know, being at school and then to an academic and now to a CEO isn't a transition that everyone makes. Uh, was it difficult? Yes, so yeah. Um, as, as CEO, I suppose uh, there's a lot of um, um, different roles and different kind of ways of thinking and communicating. So, um, um, talking about technical problems is one thing, but um, talking about management problems is another thing. Um, talking to investors is again different, and then talking to you know, journalists and the general public is another another different thing. Got to wear a lot of hats now. Got to wear a lot of hats. Um, actually, I I, I uh, when I was doing my PhD, I also um, taught as well. So in Oxford, there's tutorial teaching, which is one of the core ways that the, the university runs. Um, and it's kind of one on two um, uh, sessions. So I did that for three years at, at Lady Margaret Hall. Um, and um, again, that's another way of communicating. And that, um, that experience, I think, set me off on, a, on, on a, you know, um, um, being able to communicate to uh, uh, potential investors and, and so on. Um, yeah. And you mentioned Oxford there. Uh, and Oxford's a bit of a hub for fusion, isn't it? Um, Oxford, Oxfordshire certainly is, yeah, and that's that's mainly because of um, uh, UK AEA, um, who are the, the UK's national lab for fusion. So, um, 1,600 people working on on fusion power, about five miles from here. 
Um, so they're, they're working on um, magnetic fusion, uh, which is a different approach to, to our approach. Um, and then, yeah, Oxford University works on uh, inertial fusion, but um, not the group that I came from, actually. And so my co-founder, Yanis, he'd never worked on fusion before either. So we kind of sort of came completely left field, um, but with a very sophisticated you know, modelling approach uh, to, the, to this new problem. And do you think the UK has the knowledge and expertise to potentially become a world leader? Because obviously fusion is this burgeoning technology. Um, do you think we can latch onto that and kind of ride it to the top? Absolutely. So the UK is, is one of the world leaders right now, uh, but there's lots of investment going on all around the world. And, but it, the UK has an opportunity to be the world leader for sure. Um, fusion is going to be solved in the 2020s. And if we don't invest now, then we'll lose that. Whereas if we do invest now, it could be a competitive advantage in a new industrial sector, which is going to last for, for decades. You sound pretty confident that it's going to be solved in the 2020s. That's quite soon. Yeah, well, it is. Um, and um, even the mainstream's time frame right, is going to get it solved in the 2020s. So the, the, um, uh, the biggest project out there, biggest in terms of you know, people and money, is something called the... Um, it's been called the ITER, and um, uh, there's been lots of delay, but it's back on track, um, and it's, it's being built, um, and it's due to be finished in 2025. Um, I think we need to solve the core physics problem by the end of the 2020s. Then we need to be able to build one reactor in the 2030s, and we need to be able to build 10, 20, and 2040s. If we're going to make a difference to climate change, right, net zero by 2050, that's what fusion needs to do. So, so it is possible to... Even the mainstream is going to get there in time. If our idea works and there's, there's, there's less study and less evidence that our thing can work, you know, so we need to build that evidence and that's what we're doing. Uh, if, that, if we don't encounter any you know, fundamental barrier, then our timescales are quicker. And that's true for all other alternatives. All other alternatives are quicker than that mainstream time frame. But even the mainstream time frame is going to get there in time. Uh, get there in the 2020s. I believe you, but theoretically, could we go net zero without fusion, or is it the magic bullet that people keep talking about? Um, you could go net zero without fusion, but you can't go net zero with the technology we currently have. We need a new, clean baseload uh, power source. So um, it's, it's, it's kind of as instructive to, to ask what's not the problem as to ask what is the problem. So it's not about cost. So solar power in, in quite a few places around the world is already the cheapest form of uh, generation. In the UK, the cheapest form of generation is onshore wind. Um, it's not about cost. Uh, it's also not about managing intermittency. So firstly, it can be done. You can manage the intermittency. And the total system cost, um, uh, even including you know, the really hard intermittency, summer, winter, seasonal intermittency, at about 1.5 uh, pence per kilowatt hour to your electricity bill. So it's not huge. Um, the problem is scale. We just can't build all of this new infrastructure fast enough. So the, the Tesla Gigafactory, um, it produces enough batteries in one year to power the US for three minutes. It's just, it, the scales are vastly different. So there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of um, different possible solutions and they all have challenges um, so very large scale carbon capture and storage so taking the carbon back out of the atmosphere or out of the exhaust of the power plant um, it's very expensive um, uh, advanced nuclear technologies uh, they could do it but they all have all the baggage of of nuclear along with radioactive waste all of that stuff and then there's fusion and we need to solve the physics problem is it expensive fusion well, there must be some drawbacks, surely. Um, our approach to fusion, uh, we think, um, uh, can be cost competitive with, with gas. Um, and, and our approach is, is, we think, uniquely simple. So it's, it's simple in the approach to the, the core physics. And it, that also, there's a simplification of the, of the reactor. So our reactor reuses a lot of existing technology, actually, from, from nuclear power. Um, so uh, well-developed technologies. Uh, so uh, if we can prove the core physics problem, then we think that um, uh, our reactor will be quick to develop and, and cost competitive. Could it solve the big issues such as climate change? Can it solve energy access in developing countries? Uh, you know, it sounds like it could tackle all these big issues that we have in the world. 
In principle, it can, yeah. So it can, it can definitely solve climate change. Um, and it can definitely get us towards the, the 2050 uh, net zero uh, goal. Um, I'm, a, I'm a realist. Um, people say entrepreneurs need, entrepreneurs need to be optimists. I, try, I don't think I'm a pessimist or an optimist, I think I'm a realist. Um, to, to put a fusion technology in a country which doesn't already have an established power plant engineering capability or nuclear engineering capability or a, or a, a big national grid, it's going to take time. Uh, but for uh, the US, for Europe, for um, Japan and so on, um, fusion would absolutely be the, the silver bullet. And I'm not, you know, I don't know enough about the science to know where it could go in the future because if it's developed in the 2020s, it will advance and so on. Can it be scaled down or would you, do you still need a big central power plant or could you have distributed fusion facilities? Um, so you can make it, uh, you can make it smaller than uh, the largest power plants out there. So big, big power plants are about a gigawatt. Um, we're working on a design which is going to be more like 350 megawatts. Uh, but it'll never be, you know, under your car bonnet. Um, and that's, that's for, for physics reasons, basically. Uh, the, the smaller you make it, the harder and harder the plasma physics gets. But obviously the bigger you make it, the harder and harder the engineering gets. So um, there's a, a balance which is perhaps, you know, medium-sized. Okay. So it sounds pretty hopeful for the future, uh, but obviously things, could, things can go in an easier way or a harder way. Uh, in terms of the government and things like that, what do you want to see from regulations and policies going forward? So there's actually a really progressive, proactive conversation going on right now about, about regulations for fusion. So um, it does need appropriate regulation um, because there are, there are some aspects which do need to be managed which are unique to, to fusion. So um, uh, although the risk is much, much lower than for, uh, for um, nuclear. So, um, uh, we need to avoid the mistake which has happened in France, which is, so ITER um, is being built under full nuclear regulations, um, and that's adding a lot of cost. Um, and the conversation here has, has recognised that and said, well, okay, there are parts of the system that parts of the nuclear uh, regulation should appropriate apply to. But then there are also parts which just be completely inappropriate. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily translate between the two, does it? Uh, it definitely doesn't translate very easily between the two, no. Um, so, uh, but there, there does need to be appropriate regulation because um, uh, there is a small amount of radioactive material in a fusion power plant. And um, uh, the public has a right to be assured that a, a new technology is, uh, is safe. Um, uh, and it's, it's not up to us to decide what that regulatory environment should be, um, but we, we you know, are, 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 are trying to articulate um, um, clearly the true uh, risks which need to be managed and how much smaller they are than existing nuclear. Um, and, um, yeah, working with the regulator to, to uh, figure out how to do all of that. So it's a lot safer, but could you have, is there any potential at all for some kind of Chernobyl meltdown or for anything to go significantly wrong like that? There's no potential for a Chernobyl kind of thing. There's no, there's no meltdown risk. Uh, and there's, there's no radi radiation risks to the general public. There's, there's, like any power plant, like any complex engineering, there are a load of ways that something could happen that could destroy the plant. There's always risk to plant, but there's no risk to the general public. No mushroom clouds. There's no mushroom clouds. Okay, and uh, going back to the policy part of things, uh, we, I hear about Euratom, and again, that's creating difficulties with Brexit, where it, it's, the UK doesn't know how to translate these regulations and copy them if we leave the EU. Uh, could Brexit throw a spanner in the works for the development of fusion, or are you safe? So not, not through the whole Euratom thing. Um, fusion doesn't need the, the special materials which uh, nuclear um, needs. And what that basically means, special materials, is stuff that you could use to make power or stuff that you could use to make a weapon. Right? Fairly obviously, the stuff that you can use or could use to make a weapon needs to be very, very tightly controlled. Um, that's just not an issue for fusion. Um, there's no weapons-grade material. You couldn't break into a fusion power plant or steal the delivery truck, you know, simplistically, um, and, um, uh, and build a nuclear weapon. Um, so 
all of those sorts of complexities just, just don't apply to fusion. Okay, well, I uh, look forward to seeing what you do in the, in the future and uh, seeing where progress takes you. But thank you for talking to me. All right, thank you very much.